Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup with People's Dispatch where we bring you some of the top stories from across the globe. Let's take a look at today's headlines. Taliban offers amnesty to government officials as evacuations resume in Kabul. Death toll rises after earthquake in Haiti as rescue efforts resume. Workers in Chile's Casarones and Andaina copper mines go on strike. And in our video section, we take a look at the use of COVID-19 booster doses amid the global vaccine divide. The Taliban issued a general amnesty for all government officials on August 17. The mayor of Kabul and the Afghan health minister returned to work on Tuesday. Meanwhile, evacuations on military flights also resumed out of the Hamid Karzai airport. The US-controlled airport was shut down after thousands of Afghan civilians gathered to try and flee the country. Videos showed people climbing onto a plane as it took off from the runway. Gunfire could be heard and at least seven people were killed. The runway was cleared by Tuesday. The Taliban has stated that it will announce a new form of government soon. Senior leader Amir Khan Mutaki has met Afghan politicians including Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Bhamdullah. Meanwhile, the UN Refugee Agency has called for a halt on forced returns of Afghan nationals. UN head Antonio Guterres has urged all countries to accept refugees. This followed widely denounced statements made by French President Emmanuel Macron. He stated on Monday that EU members were working on a coordinated response against irregular migratory flows. A senior German official also stated that the, that the country would not pursue an open door policy. The country has cut development aid to Afghanistan. Greece's migration minister also said that the country will not become a gateway to Europe for refugees and migrants. Meanwhile, Turkey has started building a wall along its border with Iran to prevent refugees from entering. Moving on to our second story, in Haiti, at least 1,419 people have been killed after the island country was hit by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake on August 14th. Eight groups have indicated that another 450 deaths have been recorded in the hardest hit area. Haitian officials have also stated that 6,900 people have been injured. 37,312 houses have been destroyed and several churches and major hospitals have been seriously damaged. A majority of the casualties have been reported from the southern region. The city of Lake Ayers and surrounding areas have, been sustain have sustained the most damage. Doctors are providing care in makeshift tents after the Ofatma hospital was deemed unsafe. The crisis worsened on Monday when tropical depression grace caused heavy rains in Haiti's southern coast. This led to flooding in the worst hit areas. Despite previous forecasts, the storm moved past Haiti on Tuesday morning. Search and rescue operations have resumed. And now for our main stories, we first look at the ongoing strikes in Chile's mining sector. 320 workers at the Cazarones mine have been on strike for over a week. They have they walked out on August 10th after failed negotiations with Lumina Copper Chile. As per the union, the company stated that it did not have a budget to deliver a new offer, workers are demanding salary readjustments and increases in bonuses and benefits. Since August 11, striking workers have continued to protest on the road leading to the mine. Casarones is among the dozens of copper mines located in the Atacama Desert. This includes Escondida, which is the world's largest copper mine, producing 5% of the global supply. Over 2,000 workers at the copper mine had issued a strike notice to the BHP company. However, the union announced on August 14 that a deal had been reached. The agreement included a bonus of $23,000 for each worker. It also included an additional $4,000 for extra days worked. As two unions at the Andina Copper Mine have also been on strike since August 12th. The site is operated by the state-owned Codelco company. Over 800 workers walked out after rejecting the latest contract offer by 82%. They are organized by the Industrial Union of Labor Integration and the Unified Workers Union, now a third union. Sindicato de Union Plantas is set to vote on the contract offer. Codelco is expected to present the offer on August 17th. If the vote fails, unionized workers will join the strike. This will bring the total number of striking workers at Andaina to 1,300. Negotiations are also ongoing at Codelco's El Teniente Division. The contract of 3,300 workers organized by five unions is set to expire on October 31st. And for our final story, we, took, we take a look at the latest on COVID-19 vaccines. The U.S. has joined a growing number of rich countries administering a third dose. The U.S. FDA had issued emergency use authorization for immunocompromised people. Experts are now expected to recommend a third shot for all Americans. This push for booster doses is taking place just as many countries struggle to provide even single doses. 
The vaccination rate in the African continent remains below 2%. 12 million doses were supplied to Africa through COVAX in July. However, 183 million additional doses will be required just to inoculate 10% of the people. It is in this context that the WHO had also called for a mora moratorium on booster shots. Here is Dr. Satyajit Rath to talk more about the vaccine divide. Satyajit, very briefly, can you give us a picture of why the contradiction between what is good for rich countries who seem to be going in for a third booster dose and why the vaccination for the world, which is a public health demand which WHO has raised, is not happening? So, um, this is both an unsurprising and a deeply depressing state that we find ourselves in, where we are between the devil and the deep sea, as it were. The issue is, are we going to look at global public health or is each nation going to worry about its, its own public health, no matter what, what the consequences for global public health are? So the rich countries are clearly making the argument that because the Delta variant is well protected against as far as serious illness and death are concerned by their current vaccines, but perhaps not as well protected by against transmission. Therefore, they say, in order to cut our transmission down, we need a third dose. And therefore, we can't give these vaccines to other needy countries which haven't even had a first dose. And therefore, we are in this situation where the um, public health needs of rich countries of the global north are trumping, um, very evocative verb, the uh, public health, the fundamental public health needs of countries of the global south. And the reason why we have arrived at this point is a consequence of the capitalist logic of COVID vaccine um, invention and development and production programs, where rather than doing a worldwide open inclusive development, comparative testing, manufacture and deployment and distribution, under the WHO's aegis, as the WHO had offered to do in the early months of the pandemic, we have opted for the capitalist logic of Big Pharma primarily mediating this. And the consequence is that what we have is Big Pharma encouraged steady fragmentation of COVID-related public policies into nationalist approaches where the global north reserves early effective vaccines for itself and the global south is supposed to deal with uh, uh, its own problems with a little bit of overflow charity as it were this is the sorry state of affairs that we have landed in and this is all we have for this episode of the International Daily Roundup. For more such stories and videos, visit our website peoplesdispatch.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching.